This show is produced by the Hartman Media Company. For more information and links to all our great podcasts, visit HartmanMedia.com. Welcome to the American Monetary Association's podcast, where we explore how monetary policy impacts the real lives of real people and the action steps necessary to preserve wealth and enhance one's lifestyle. It's my pleasure to welcome a returning guest back to the show, uh, Harry Dent, the prolific author that I discovered back in 1995 and I've been following for many years. He's an economic demographer. I think that's the proper way to say it. He can correct me if it's not. And he has some interesting things to share with us today. For those of you listening, I just want you to know that this will also be on our YouTube channel because there are several visual aids that Harry came prepared with, charts and graphs and interesting stuff to look at. So after you listen to this, if you're not watching the video, feel free to go to the YouTube channel and you can actually see it there. But for those of you listening, not able to watch, we will try and describe the charts as well so that you get the best of both worlds. Harry, welcome back. It's great to have you. I think this is your eighth time on my show, right? Yeah, sounds right. Yep. Something like that. And you're coming to us today from where you live in Puerto Rico, correct? Puerto Rico. Yes. Better weather than Florida. Everybody thinks it's hotter down here. It's less hot at extremes, lower cost, especially for a beachfront condo compared to South Beach where I used to live. And the taxes advantages are incredible down here for uh, people from the United States. Ugh. The Puerto Rico tax benefits are literally the best deal an American can get in the entire world because the IRS is one of the only taxing authorities on earth that actually taxes Americans on all worldwide income. But Puerto yeah. Rico has a very unique exemption to that. <laughs> and many of my friends have moved there to take advantage of it. Uh, of course, the famous or infamous Peter Schiff lives there. Yep. And he's I just saw a, him yesterday. Yeah. We were at a conference, both of us on panels, different yeah. panels, but yeah. Good stuff. Yeah, I saw him in Dorado Beach when I was there in yep. November. Yeah, uh, so what I call Gringo Disneyland. Right. Hey, if you think you got to move down here and can't live in the best of American style, you're wrong. And, and yeah. Dorado is a great example yeah. of that. It's a Ritz-Carlton resort. It's gorgeous. Yes. But Harry, I'll tell you, it is very expensive, the real estate in yeah, Dorado. That, it's not that cheap. is. Yeah. The rest of it's affordable. I've got a $500 square foot condo that would be $2,000 for the similar location and quality in South Beach where I used to live. So oh, that's, that's yeah, Dorado, you're right. Dorado's about, I wouldn't be buying in Dorado yeah, myself. Yeah, very expensive. Well, hey, listen, you are famous for your predictions on all aspects of the economy. We've got a chart up now that says QE, quantitative easing, creates Frankenstein, markets on crack, 120% overvalued. And then it says births are lagged for peak spending versus the real Dow Jones Industrial Average. Now, I was actually talking about this on, on my show just yesterday about how births need to be lagged. So, for example, you talk about the peak spending time and the peak earning time in people's yes. career. And so you can't say, well, you know, there's a lot of people being born today. You need to yeah. look back, what, 46 years, right? Yeah, or, yeah. Kid, kids are a liability. Kids cost. Kids growing up cause inflation, especially as they enter the workforce. And, and businesses have to invest after governments and education and parents raising them. What's key is people spend money dramatically higher from workforce entry, age 20 on average, into 46 for the boomers. It's now 47 for the millennials, now more driving the economy incredibly increasingly. And it'll be, it looks like to be about 48 for the zillennials to follow. So, yeah, it, that, this was my first breakthrough indicator, Jason, back in the late 80s when I saw how big this boom was going to be because the baby boom was so giant. It's just moving forward, the birth index adjusted for immigration, which I can also do accurately for the peak spending of the average person household. And it's in, it tells you when the economy is going to boom and bust. It called everything perfectly. I mean, again, I, this indicator, I came up 1988. I said this boom's going to peak by the end of 2007, and it did, and we've been living on quantitative easing ever since after the baby boomers slowed down in their spending. Right. The next generation doesn't come along till about 2023, the millennials. And, and this shows how much the market's been overvalued simply because of quantitative easing. Slow down for a second. Okay, I want to just get some foundational things, make sure the listeners and, and viewers understand them. So first of all, what is the age of someone's peak earning power? 
and peak spending. What are those two? Are they, They're about the same, right? They're not they're too far about off. the same. It, it's, it was 46 for the baby boomers. 46 it's years 47 old. today for the millennials. And, in, and when I look at in the past in Europe and Australia and other markets I deal with, most other places, it's about 47. Okay, so in and, and is that peak spending and earning, or are they peak slightly spending? Well, well, the spending is what matters to the economy because people, as they get a little older, they they save more. The spending is the critical back. The earnings peak close to that, but the spending is what correlates with the markets the most. Okay, great. So forty six years old for the baby boomers, the millennials, they're a, a year behind, and yeah, it's forty seven. Now okay. that's built into this lag. So the lag is naturally extended to forty seven as we switch to millennials in this chart. Going okay. Forward. Now you also mentioned Zillennials, and I haven't heard anyone yeah. refer to it that way, but that's Generation Z, right? Yes. Okay. So understanding these demographic cohorts is very important. As I've said many times, baby boomers, you know, depending on who you ask, about 76 million Americans, millennials, about 80 million Americans, my generation in between the two, tiny little generation, about 46 million, I guess, Gen X. Gen X. That's that's the downs. That's the lower birth generation, which had caused the downturn after 2007. Well, sorry about that, folks. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, Yes, I, I, I'm in this little lonely generation with. Uh, well, well about, you're the lucky ones because you people. get to buy everything at the bottom. You get, oh, you know, okay. so so you're actually, you know, it's an advantage. My father was in the smaller generation, um, born in the 30, early 30s, mm-hmm. before the baby boom. Every house, everything he bought, always went up. Oh, the baby that's boomers drove him up, coming after him. Ah, yeah, that, that's interesting. So the millennials yeah. will drive up things for the uh, Xers. Oh, yeah, okay, interesting. You know, that's especially real estate. Interesting idea. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so what does this chart tell us? So we've, so really, we've been living on quantitative easing coming out of the Great Recession, which means yes. effectively, you know, the easing of the money supply, the increase in the money supply. Part of it is, you know, money creation, money printing, as they say. It's not really printed much nowadays. What does that mean? I mean, what? tell us what that means. Okay, real quickly, this is very important. It's not actually a substantial increase in the money supply. Normally what the central banks have done in the past, they lower interest rates, they make money more available, they do expand the money supply and create more reserves for banks, so banks will tend to lend money. What happened with the Federal Reserve when we came into the Great Recession is they didn't realize Consumers and businesses had already overborrowed, overbought housing, overexpanded businesses and capacity. They didn't need to borrow. And of course, banks tighten up. So, so that didn't work. What, what ended up happening is the Federal Reserve ended up doing, doing quantitative easing rather than just reserves and lower rates. Quantitative easing is not putting money into the bank system and lending. It is literally buying financial assets like bonds, which puts more money into the pool that's actually chasing financial assets. And that drives up financial assets. So what this chart is showing, while the economy kept slowing, and you got to remember, this is the slowest recovery in all of history, 2% average real growth versus 4 5% or more in past recoveries. And that's with all, with $16 trillion printed by, by central bank. But the money did not go into the banking system, did not go into consumer lending, which does expand the money supply. We got, and, and this is why the gold bugs were wrong. We did not get an inflation surge or hyperinflation. What we have is the greatest financial asset bubble in history, greater than the roaring twenties. And the stock market, I mean, it's true of real estate. Real estate's gone up. Everything else too. Bonds are in a bubble, but real estate is the strongest bubble and where it benefits the most from low interest rates, more money chasing financial assets. And so what this thing has showed, this blue line in the background shows where the economy should be in stocks normally followed that, adjusted for inflation. But even with this weak recovery, which would have been worse than weak, it would have been a down economy without all this stimulus, stocks have gone straight up like it's the best economy in history, and they now are 120% overvalued. And I'll show just – let me show one more chart – that 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 120% difference is the difference between the black line here which is earnings per share of stock versus the blue line which is total corporate earnings which came back up after recession strong stimulus and they've hardly grown since earnings per share have been grown because companies are buying back their stocks the third chart you know 5.6 remember the 
Fed printed about 3.7 trillion. Central banks around the world about 16 trillion total. 3.7 was printed. 5.6 trillion because of the low long term rates and the and the flush money in the economy. 5.6 trillion have gone to buying stocks back. Shrinks the number of shares, which leverages greatly leverages the earnings per share and therefore the stock price. So so this is an artificial bubble in stocks that has nothing to do with the economy, which the blue line shows you where it should be. Okay, okay, slow down on that one. So you're it sounds like you're saying that. The stock market is really not increasing in value as much as it would seem. It's it's simply generated by smoke and mirrors of stock buybacks that are increasing the numbers in the stock market, right? Yes, yes. And, and company stocks are going up mostly because of the leverage of shrinking the number of shares rather than the growth in the economy, which again – Two percent average since 2009. This whole recovery, the slowest recovery by far in all. Even the great, De- the Great Depression, we came screaming out of that stock crash from 1933 forward. So this is a fake economy, and particularly an artificially overvalued stock market, which means, and here's the important thing: stocks, which have only been bought this fourth line by the red line, is companies buying their own stocks. Everybody else is basically neutral. So investors aren't even net buying stocks. And then what it creates is a big financial bubble in stocks that most crash, which you'll see in the fist chart here. People in Wall Street keep saying, well, this isn't a bubble because of this or that and that. Look at this bubble. We've had four bubbles, two minor. The big one with tech in 2000, which everybody agreed was a bubble. Now, look at this bubble. This bubble makes all of them look like nothing. This is the greatest bubble in history. It's global. The the real point here, and I want to focus on this chart. Well, I I have a question. Is the entire – I mean, look, you you say the economy is fake, and you're you're not wrong about that, but – Hasn't it always been kind of fake and like most countries around the world are these fake propped up economies through funny fiscal and monetary policy? I mean, you know, that that's not exactly unique to the last 10 years, is it? Right. No, it's not. I mean, I'll I'll give you a quick example. Federal. I always like to ask compared to what? Right. Yes, it's it's true that the economy is built on a, a smoke and mirrors but it's been that way for a long time. And, okay. and this so is very important. Jay. Yeah, Let me ahead. make this crystal yeah. clear. Okay. Governments always stimulate the economy. Right. Always right. try to prevent right. recessions, lower interest rates. They always push things. This they've never done quantitative easing on this matter. This is a this is a cannon, right. you know, a bazooka compared to a pistol. Okay. okay, got it. Got it. So so the Federal Reserve was created. We didn't have a Federal Reserve before 1913. Mm-hmm. And guess what happened? They kept lowering interest rates every time there was the least slowdown and then kept the economy from rebalancing and, and shaking out bad companies and bad loans, which which keeps you more in balance. And we just got a bigger and bigger bubble into 1929. And then 20 years after the Fed was created in 1933, we were at the bottom of the worst depression in all of U.S. history, 25 percent unemployment, blue chip stocks like Ford and General Motors and RCA back then. It's like Microsoft and Apple and Google today, down 89%. They created a bubble because of constantly stimulating and then it crashed. But the difference is the stock market still generally went with that spending wave I had. It just gets higher than it should be and then it crashed with the economy. What we have this time, an economy that should have kept going down with slower spending, but all this stimulus made the rich people. Now, let me, here's another Another important statistic, very simple, the top 20 percent of households, the most affluent in this country, college educated professional workers own 88 percent of the financial assets outside of people's own home. Eighty eight percent. They've made they've been made rich by this bubble. They're spending more than ever. Everyday households that did not benefit, who own very little stocks, and they own smaller homes that didn't bubble as much because they're in everyday places, and that's why they're much better value now. So they're not experiencing this, so they're spending 
very slowly. And the high end, now that 20%, you say, but it's only 20%. They control 50% of the consumer spending. So 20% controls 50%. So here's how I would describe our 2% growth economy. Zero for everyday people, 4% for the affluent. And we average 2%. In a normal boom, both would be spending. We'd be averaging 4%. Okay. So the moral of that is the rich are getting richer, uh, yes. the middle class is disappearing, or at least the lower part of the middle class. Yes. Some of the middle class is moving up and moving into the upper middle class, but the lower middle class is is declining, sadly, and, and the poor are yes. still poor. Yeah. Okay. Next chart. Okay. So we looked at buyback. I mean, $5.6 trillion. That's what's made the stock market. This is new money. This is shrink. This is leveraging stocks. It's companies taking money out of their strong cash flow in an artificial economy that would be much weaker without super low interest rates and all of this stimulus uh, that, that's affecting the upper class. And they're just shrinking their shares. It's leveraging. They are leveraging their own shares, which says Two things, Jason. They're going to go up way faster, which that first chart showed how much they're overvalued, 120 percent, which mean, and means they're going to crash more when they come down. And, and all of a sudden, their stockholders are going to say two or three, four years from now, oh, why aren't we buying our stocks back now that they're cheap? Oh, you know why? We spent all of our cash flow buying them when they were expensive. Companies now – I, I tell people it was the shoe shine boys, you know, the dumb money, right, I hate to yeah, say it, buying yeah. stocks in 29. It is the Fortune 500 executives and the richest people in this country, most buying stocks. Everyday people are not driving this stock bubble. It, it, I showed that. that oh, here's, the, here's the next chart. Uh oh. It's not, I, I, I got a is. question, though, before you move on about stock buybacks. You know, a lot of people criticize stock buybacks, Harry, but I'm wondering. Is it really that bad? I mean, when when a company buys back its own stock, it's kind of doubling down, right? It's showing faith in itself, isn't it? Uh, isn't yeah, that, yeah. Isn't that so a good sign? I mean, do, I mean, look, like one, question, one, of, one of the metrics people look at is they look at what are the insiders doing? And if the insiders are selling, investors lose faith in that company. Here, essentially, with the buybacks, the insiders are buying. I mean, maybe it's the treasury account, but... Yes, they're buying. If you're doing it in normal times, if you just like slowly over a boom like the 50s and 60s, bought a little more of your stock, yeah, you're just, you're just making a little more advantage, a little more leverage for things. When you buy into a bubble like this, and I just, you know, the steepest bubble in all of history, you're taking precious cash flow, which company, believe me, the companies in the 30s that survived a bubble crash of this level, the ones that survived were General Motors that had better cash flow and could get through it. The other ones went under. And so the surviving companies buy their assets for nothing, take over their customers. Cash flows everything. You're using your cash flow in a boom to leverage your stock and make it bubble-like so it will crash more. And the worst consequence, you won't have that cash in the downturn to survive and then to reinvest and, and leave your competitors in the rear view mirror. So yes, if you did it normally and over time and judiciously, it's just like having, okay, this is like having a glass of wine a day. Most people say, oh, that's oh, good for you. Relax a little bit. You have a couple of bottles a day. No, that's not, not, good. not a good practice. Right. That's it's what this is. This is a couple of bottles in okay. the late stages of the greatest bubble. And these, I'm just telling you, Jason, I'm saying this today so I can remind people a few years from now, these are going to look like the stupidest people in history that bought, took their share, these successful companies took their shareholders' money and gambled it on their own stock, leveraging it up as if, as if these stocks weren't doing okay as well, and basically screwed their shareholders. Mm -hmm. Okay. That, interestingly, though, will redistribute some wealth. <laughs> Back into the middle, maybe. Yeah, hey, yeah, yeah. Well, we don't need Bernie Sanders. This is going to be the fastest wealth redistribution from the rich to the everyday, just like in the 30s. The, the rich got richer in the 1929 and into 75, you know, for, for many things. They lost some of their advantage in, in share of, of wealth and income. That's going to happen here very quickly in wealth. And then, OK, I mean, so I said the only people buying that this one chart here shows the red line is corporations buying their own stocks. The blue line is foreigners, so just barely buying, but less so. 
The green line is households. They have not been buying into this bubble. They're scared to death. They got killed in the last bubble in 2008 and 9 mm-hmm. when it crashed 54% and they didn't know why. And then you got the instant the blue the purple line that's the smart money the institutional investors they have net not been buying they don't see value mm-hmm. in this market getting so overvalued so so that's what's happening and that's what's created this next chart it just shows this is look okay and we're the, and we're still we're still focused on the stock market so we'll get to the stock, broader economy in a, and, in a and moment i'll tell here. you why jason because yeah. the stock market is the best leading indicator right. of the economy i agree and gets way more overvalued than real estate in a bubble. But real estate's in a bubble too, but it's more on the high end and in certain places, yeah. as you know. The cyclical markets, yeah. But the stock market is a good way to say, gosh, are we in a good place or are we about to see the crash of a lifetime? And I'm making the argument, we're about to see something worse than 2008 and nine, And we saw what happened to real estate and the economy and banks and in people underwater and mortgages and what did well, like affordable housing and apartments versus what? High-end houses and, and, right. and what did the worst? Bubbly stocks. Yeah, right. High-end houses are like high-flying dot-com stocks they that don't are. make any sense. You know, they, they, they really have trouble in, in bad times. You know, Harry, when you look at all of these charts and we th- talk about all of these crazy numbers, whether it be the Q numbers or debt numbers or, you know, stock uh, buybacks or whatever. Are these things adjusted for inflation? Like, you know, the chart you're showing now dates uh, showing this the, one's the not. first bubble. Yeah, OK. Yeah. The first bubble in 1986, a minor bubble, and then another one in the mid, well, mid to late 90s. That's the dot com bubble, I guess. Right. That was the dot com yeah. bubble. And, and then that was considered, oh, my gosh, huge bubble. Right. And, that, you know, and then there's the post 9-11 bubble. OK, yes. which was because of all that 9-11 stimulation. And, and now there's the stock market bubble we're in now. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Wow, and, 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 and so when somebody staggering. says any analyst for any reason, there's a million reasons, this is not a bubble. My response is looks like a bubble, walks like a bubble, quacks like a bubble. It's a bubble. Mm-hmm. This yeah. is the this makes 1925 to 29 look like nothing. And look at it compared. Now, again, this is not the Nasdaq, which is more bubbly. This is the Dow. And compared to the bubble back in 95 to 2000. So again, that was a major bubble. We had a minor bubble before and not. And, and one of the reasons I use this chart also, Jason, I would tell people we have four seasons in the economy. The bubble boom is the fall season, like we saw in the early 1900s. And this, you expect bubbles. And just even though that 87 was a small bubble, it was a 40% crash in two weeks. That never happened in the entire 1942 to 1968 stock market boom. It wasn't a bubble boom. The corrections were 20%. They weren't 40, 50% here. I'm projecting 70 to 85% when this one blows. So, so, so again, the point here, though, forget all the complications and the stuff. If this stock bubble blows anywhere near what I'm saying, you know how much wealth disappears well, in the economy? Well, just, this next, just, yeah. just the other day when the stock market hit the first coronavirus scare, when it started paying attention to that, and then the following day it was also down, it literally everything was down. I can't remember the stat I read, but – it was just a monumental amount of what, money was just one point one point seven trillion in two days. Wow, that's what it was. That's unbelievable. Now, I mean, yeah. now look at this next chart real quick. Okay. We look at this whole bubble. You see how much more bubbly this is. The blue line is stock, is financial assets, and and it is dominated by stocks. But but it is realist. Uh, it, it's outside of private home. But all of the financial assets, bonds, commodities, stocks, uh, investment, real estate. Okay, so 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 like twenty three like, trillion. Wait, okay, wait wait wait. Let's talk about the real estate component. Investment real estate, we're talking about, you know, the commercial real estate sector, like office buildings, industrial properties, maybe large institutional multifamily housing. Well, well, but even even I think vacation homes, you know, not your primary home. That's what this is. All right. Interesting. So we we look at the normal range back all the way to 1950 of how much financial assets should be compared to GDP. So so we're really, in this sense, adjusting them for GDP. We're adjusting them for inflation. We're measuring relative to the growth of the economy underlying it. We've been in increasing bubble since the early to mid 90s, right when the tech bubble came and up and up and up. We now have a hundred just in the U.S., 
$123 trillion in financial assets owned by households. And if we just go back to normal valuations down 50%, and note in the chart before I'm projecting the Dow, the most bubbly stocks, uh, the stocks are more bubbly than, than these other asset categories like bonds and commodities and investment real estate. If overall assets go down 50%, which would bring them down to reality, $60 trillion dollars that is three times our entire annual gdp disappears from brokerage accounts bank accounts blah 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 don't you think people would spend a little less money in the economy week when they lost that much money yeah it's really in my my point who's keeping our economy going this top 20 percent the top one percent top 10 percent they're the ones that are going to pull back much more than homer simpson this time and so hang on a second let's just explain this a little bit okay so this chart as you said goes back to 1950 and what it shows is it shows a range from 1950 on up to really about 1990, well, yeah. yeah, about 1990, 95. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. That things are sort of in line from 1950 to 1995. After 1995, they start to get really out of whack, and in in relation to GDP. Okay, so these financial assets. And I almost want to put the word assets in quote when they're financial assets because they're sort of smoke and mirrors economy, Wall Street economy, not the Main Street economy. Um, They are showing that they're in a bubble. Now, the top, you said 20 percent is responsible for most of the spending and the S&P. Half the spending and they own 88 percent of these financial assets. Got it. Okay, so in the S and understand how that relates. So when they pull back about 70 percent or 72 percent of the entire S&P 500 is based on consumer spending. And so if they spend less, that creates this downward spiral where the all those companies that supply all those goods and services, they'll spend less. And so this puts downward pressure on all of those stocks or 72% of them in the S&P, right? Yes. And you got to realize this financial asset bubble has created this kind of extra wealth. And it's not all spent. It's not all spent like normal income, but some of it's spent and mainly by these rich people. So the economy is stronger than it would be. I, I, you know, that, that spending wave I showed in the first chart, that big blue wave of baby boomers and then the downturn with the Xers like you, that shows our economy should have been not only uh, not growing at 2%, it should have been declining like it did for most of the 1930s overall. And so even the growth in our economy has been artificial, propped up by this temporary artificial wealth from financial assets, but it's been made Mainly this top 20 percent spending the money, not Homer Simpson. So they've been get, they've been having the boom. They're the reason it's going up. And when they stop spending that, they're going to be the biggest reason. In other words, a, normally a slowing economy causes a stock correction or crash. What's happen, What's going to happen this time, a crashing stock market is going to cause a recession on its own and then take us back to where we really should have been in a long recession anyway when, when the largest generation in history naturally spent less because they don't have kids to raise and get through college anymore. Okay, let's go to that next chart of the 90-year Great Resets. Yeah, now this is a chart I've had since an early, one of the first charts I had along with uh, uh, the Kondratiev wave, uh, four-season cycle, and the 30-year commodity cycle. This shows, now if you go back to late 1700s, Uh, Right there, we got this dotted line saying we're going from British stock prices to U.S. That is when the stock exchanges started. Before that, it's all just a few big government-owned stocks like like the South Seas Company and the India Trading Company, stuff like that. This is the the real stock market. The Dutch East India Company, yeah. (laughs) We're we're going back a long way here. Since then, you can see – now, first of all, this chart is adjusted for inflation and it's also adjusted for exponential growth, and it's still exponential. I mean, the stock markets have grown so much in this era that it, you can't even compare it to anything. Uh, first of all, we didn't have stocks much before that, but but this is already adjusted for exponentiality and for inflation. And look at stocks go up and up and up, and they keep bubbling more and more. But note, every ninety years, like a clock. 
you see a more bubbly stock market and a bigger crash. If you look back in the early the 1800s, 1837, the Panic of 1837 led to the biggest crash in stocks in U.S. history, down to 42. And I'm telling you, back then, Jason, real estate was the center of that bubble. Everybody moving to the West, government was giving away free land, free loans, overstimulating, a lot of speculation. Chicago became the next New York in a matter of decades and then crashed 90 some percent. So Mm. the biggest real estate crash, that was the biggest depression before the 1930-32. So you see, okay, then stocks after that, big, big, long time to get over that. Then they go up more normal rates. Oh, oh, they're bubbling into 1929. Oh, and then big crash, 89 percent crash, Great Depression, even greater than that one back then. And here we are. Then we go up. Note this time even faster than before. But then we get really bubbly here. And then we're just we're right here coming 2019 to 20, that 90 year cycle. I've been warning about this for a long time is due to hit. And and what central banks have really done is play into this bubble cycle by goosing financial assets. Again, not by lowering interest rates or a little fiscal stimulus, you know, building dams or something or running government debit, literally pushing trillions of dollars into financial markets to make them go up way more than they should, as my model shows. And so this bubble's getting ready to crash and cause the next Great Depression, not recession, not 2008, nine. That was a deep recession. This will be more like a depression, but good news for me, our fundamental indicators show that we should be done with this by 2023 and back up again. It's between now and then that I am concerned and warning people to get out of bubbly real estate, out of stocks altogether. Bonds, high quality bonds are good. Junk bonds you got to get out of. If you're in affordable housing that can rent out, if you're in apartment buildings, you're in medical buildings and, 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 and that sort of real estate investment, only high quality bonds and, and the best rental real estate hold up in a downturn like this. Everything else, stocks, commodities, you know, speculative real estate, vacation, everything else goes down. Yeah, wow, that's something. Now, what's interesting about it is this is a pretty quick downturn, right? It's it's yes. uh, why it why, be over why is in it three why, years? Why 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 is it so? Why is it so quick? Uh, I'm glad um, it's I'm glad it's short lived. That's good, <laughs> but why? Because when these bubbles burst, it's just a, it, it's a chain reaction because there's so much leverage in the markets. And so, I mean, again, leverage being put in by these S&P 500 executives buying their own stocks. They're leveraging their stocks. People can borrow money cheap and they can buy real estate. Everybody buys real estate with low money down and, and all that sort of stuff and uses profits from existing real estate to roll into even more speculative real estate. So so you build these bubbles. There's a lot of debt and leverage behind it when these debts fail. It just exacerbates the whole thing. So 29 to 32 in 2.7 years, stocks. And and again, we're talking blue chip stocks, not penny stocks, not small cap stocks, not Zimbabwe stocks or emerging countries. Blue chip U.S. and European stocks. And in the case in the U.S. went down 89 percent in 2.7 years. And you know what? Never saw that again. Did nothing. Look look at the chart. You go back to the 30s, that great reset from the three to the four kind of. Thing then in the early 30s, stocks did nothing but go up. If you'd have bought stocks then, you'd have made money forever. If you'd have bought real estate, stocks bottomed in July 32. The real estate market bottomed in March of 33. And from then, if you'd have bought real estate or stocks, you'd have made money forever. You'd have bought them at the lowest price ever. And you would never see that again. That's why this is uh, people right. get scared when I say this, but this is a huge opportunity. Yeah, okay. Let's look at the NASDAQ and the Fed balance sheet. It's the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve versus the NASDAQ. What's going on there? Yeah, okay. So that 90-year cycle right now is the most important provable cycle. It's actually two 45-year technology cycles building. each other. That's another part of my model. I, you know, I've got my demographic model, my technology model. The technologies create these bubbles. And, and what's the biggest bubble now? Micro. Microsoft, Google, uh, Apple, uh, Netflix, these tech leading technology stocks. Since what happened here recently, the Fed 
had been doing all this quantitative easing into 2014, then they just kind of held off and, and just kept it even. They didn't, they didn't reduce their balance sheet and stimulus, but they didn't increase it. But then in 2018, they did. They started selling their bonds instead of buying. That means you're taking money out of the financial asset pool. And things got down. The bank reserves went down and stuff until all of a sudden the repo, the overnight lending market. For banks to banks, especially banks that are on leverage speculating and stuff and hedge funds, that sort of stuff, dried up and the Fed had to step in. The Fed said, oh, we're going to taper. And you know what? We're confident tapering because we think the economy is so strong. We don't need all this stimulus anymore. And I've said from the beginning, no, without this stimulus, this economy will die so fast because it's so artificial. As that, that's the, that, and, that, and that just you know compared to what again – that's every economy on the planet. Every you know, economy on the planet. Yeah. We're, in fact, we're not. Japan's way worse than we oh, are. Yeah, China's yeah. way more over leveraged. We're uh, Europe's got worse demographics. Yeah, we're still the yeah. best house in a bad neighborhood right. here. And I'm yeah. showing how bad it is here. That's that's, quick, that's that's yeah. the that's the really amazing thing, Harry. You know, you so aptly pointed out that Japan's got a huge demographic problem. It's been suffering with for a long time. Oh, the, Japan the worst. Japan yeah. has got weird stuff going on. You know, there's just that's that's just a strange economy. Well, well like young people um, not having sex. That's oh, pretty weird. I know. It's totally weird. Like women in Japan marry themselves. They have weddings with just them, no groom. They it's, can't it's, afford to have a man. I can't afford to have a, a, a kid. It's, it's just weird. Yeah, Japan is a different kind of bird. But China, and I mean, we're not even discussing coronavirus or anything like that yet. Or, you know, maybe we won't at all. But, but China has a demographic problem due to the one-child yes. policy. Now, that yeah. hits... That starts to show itself in about 10, maybe 15 years. No, right? no, 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 no. Sooner? Back up, Jason. No, okay. it, their workforce already peaked in 2011 and has been declining. The second thing they've been doing is is overamping urbanization, mm -hmm. moving people from rural to urban areas. Right. The price of real estate from all their stimulus and overbuilding and growth and the pollution and the and the traffic are so bad that these rural migrants are actually turning around, going they back They want to go home. back to the country, so yeah. So <laughs> now they have two things. Their demographics have been weakening, but if you keep building stuff and, and urbanizing, well, now the urbanization has stopped and, and nobody sees that. I dig out this data and say, hey, the demographics peaked in 2011. The first emerging country to peak, like Japan was the first developed country to peak back in the early 90s. China is the first emerging country to peak in demographics, and now their urbanization is backfiring on them. They are going to go down. You, you I mean, know, it's going to be the biggest the, bubble first. I, I remember in the late 80s, all of the xenophobia about Japan. Everybody was worried, oh, Japan's buying the U.S. They bought Rockefeller Center they're buying, you know, the movie studios, they're buying everything. And it turns out all that really happened is they bought that stuff at the peak of the market, yeah. paid taxes on it for several years, and then sold it back. Yeah, at sold a lower it back. Price. We got it back at a bargain. I know. It's like, it's like the S&P 500 right. people. They're leveraging in a bubble, these S&P 500 companies, and then people are going to be able to buy their stocks back at a bargain when they bought them at the highest prices and screwed their own shareholders. I, I know. And then if anybody listening is worried about you know, if they're like in the U.S. or in the West and they're worried, oh, China is going to take over. I, no. I think I think <laughs> of, if you look at the 10 largest economies in the world, the U.S. is like you said, it's the best looking house in a bad neighborhood. OK, yeah. the U.S. is in pretty good shape comparatively, isn't yes, it? We're, we're going to come out of this the best in the developed world uh, outside of Australia. It's got stellar demographics because they're getting mm. all this Asian immigration. But let me right. quote something else, because like, I just got this the other day. Okay. China, they finally had a study by the University of Hong Kong, which is more independent and can do this thing and show that China has been over reporting their GDP systematically. Oh, and, imagine, imagine that. <laughs> so first of all, when you look in U.S. dollars, yeah. Their economy is only 65 percent, 64 percent as large as the U.S. after all this massive expansion and high growth. But when you adjust for the real growth rates, which they said were 1.7 percentage points lower for the last decade, they're only 54 percent the size. Their GDP per person, which really counts because they got four times the population. 9,800 under their reported GDP statistics, but under the new ones, it's 8,000. So they are uh, a sixth of our standard of living. So China, for, and they also said China now 
even if their growth rates double ours in the past decade or something, they won't surpass us as the largest economy until 2036. I think they're going to have a bigger downturn than anybody thinks. So I think it's going to be 2040 or later. And their GDP per capita will never surpass ours. So yes, and I was, I came up with my indicators, you know, that spending wave I showed you and many others in the late 80s, finally, formally. And it showed me Japan was getting ready to collapse. They had a bubble that we didn't have. And their baby boom was getting ready to tank, which would trigger that bubble burst, you know. And everybody said back then Japan was going to overtake the U.S. economy in two decades, which back in that case, unlike China with, with such massive population urbanization, that was not even possible. The Japanese would have to have three times the GDP per capita to make up for a smaller generation. So it shows you how economists just project trends and don't understand cycles and don't adjust things. Remember when you said before, is this adjusted for, you know, inflation? Well, yeah. And is it, are things adjusted for the size of the economy, GDP? If you don't make these adjustments, then statistics don't make sense. It's really something. It really is. Harry, are you finished with the charts? Well, well, just this one last chart. Okay. The the biggest short-term thing happening is the Fed, because the repo crisis, was forced to inject money. And they say, oh, it's not quantitative easing. We're just buying repo. Every time you inject money, now, now what you're you wait, wait, wait. What you're talking about is the repo market, okay? Yeah. Which has been talked about a lot lately. That has been in the news big time. Explain the repo market, just so our listeners have some context there, Harry, if you would. Yeah, yeah. Banks, you know, especially in this bubble. Oh, boom. Do a lot of speculating hedge funds. So Wall Street's always doing a lot of speculating on leverage and stuff. So banks and financial institutions, you know, like, you know, Merrill Lynch and all these sort of stuff, they are basically, you know, they have certain margin requirements and things they have to meet. And overnight, sometimes a bank, uh oh, we're not meeting our regs. So we need to just borrow money. So they just borrow overnight. And what typically happens is the really big banks like J.P. Morgan and stuff and Bank of America, the really big banks have so much assets and reserves, they'll just do these overnight loans to make, you know, one and a half, two percent, blah, blah, blah. Well, when their reserves got down, when the when the Fed started shrinking their balance sheet, which shrinks reserves twice as fast, and I don't want to get into that, but that's what happens. These banks all said, well, wait a minute, we don't have enough liquidity here to keep doing this. And the Fed had to step in, and I'm telling you how much, $424 billion since mid-September when this happened, they have put into the market to keep it flush. So basically, they had to go back to injecting money. into. And I don't care if they buy T-bills or bonds or Japan's even buying stocks. They're so desperate to put money in. doesn't matter what you buy. It's increasing the money chasing all financial assets because it's its own pool. It's not going to the bank lending, as I said before, and it's not going to consumers. If you wanted to really stimulate the economy, you would send a check to consumers and then it would be spent and it would go into bank bank accounts and bank lending potentially. But so the Fed basically said, oh, we're taper. Everything be all right. And I warned, no way. The repo crisis was the first sign of many to come. The economy cannot live without crack. It's a market's on crack. They're living on stimulus, all this additional liquidity, all these super low rates, which make stocks and real estate more valuable, just the low rates alone. Without it, all this thing comes down in the, in the economy class. So this is the first warning. Oh, no, if the Fed shrinks their balance sheet, well, now I'm, I'm telling you, within months, the Fed's going to be back at their peak before they tapered. But the point is, I now have an indicator on a two and a half week lag. So it gives us a little notice, two and a half, three weeks. Stocks are following. We're in this final certain. They're following this injection by the Fed. Right, Grant. And I've been saying we're due for a correction, which we're now getting because that has been moving sideways because the repos have gone down in need, but the Fed still p- pumping money in addition because they don't want this repo crisis to come back. And the Fed and all central banks are reacting to the coronavirus. Oh my God, if this thing blows up, we better have a lot of liquidity in the economy so the economy doesn't blow up with it. So yeah. And this is why stocks are going up now and and why they're going sideways now. I think 
that central banks and the Fed are going to keep stimulating more. But at least now, if they do start to taper, if they if this indicator, the blue line, will go sideways or down, then stocks are going to go sideways to down. If it starts to accelerate, which I expect is more likely to happen in the coming months, they're going to go right back up again. Hmm. So this is the short term saying, OK, here's what's happening short term. This is how the final bubble is being stimulated by this Fed injection. And the same thing happened in the tech bubble. In late 99, the Fed suddenly put in $150 billion, which now would be like $300 billion and equivalent, you know, adjusted for right. inflation terms. And that goosed the last six months of the uh, tech bubble. Mm-hmm. And then it burst as soon as they pulled that back. Right. So, so this repo bubble is pay- playing into this final bubble. And I'm just telling people, as much as I, I know this is going to crash, it ain't time to go running from stocks yet until you see the Fed pulling back. We're going to be telling our subscribers, hey, you know, we'll let you know when it looks more dangerous. Right now, this correction's probably not going to go a lot lower. And Pretty then interesting. If yeah. they step up uh, more stimulus, then it'll it'll go up again. Many many years ago, I think back into the mid or late nineties, you made an interesting prediction that I've always thought about since I've been following you for what. 25 years now. (laughs) That prediction was that the baby boomers would start to sell off their big McMansions or just big family houses and become empty nesters. And interestingly, that has come true. I think you were maybe a few years early on that prediction, possibly. They are. And surprisingly, a lot of them are quite content to be renters and just not have the burdens. And and that's that's a surprise to see baby boomers move into the rental market in mass like we've seen it right it's a surprise it's never the baby boomers change everything what basically happened in a nutshell jason these the baby boomers grew up in good times unlike the bob hope generation before them you know great depression and world war ii when they were entering the workforce and starting their careers like the millennials today similar thing they they didn't save they, and they're watching their house go up you know this housing bubble and their stocks go up and they're like well why do we should say well we'll just when we retire we'll be worth so much money well what's happened now their mcmansions have bubbled up and they're real Realizing, oh my gosh, with the economy slowing since 2008 and being more questionable and seeing bubbles burst, they're saying, gosh, we need assets to retire on. And they're coming to the conclusion, unlike most people who stay in their house or downsize to a smaller house, they're selling their McMansion using those huge bubble profits, which is a very smart thing to do, by the way, by accident, Mm -hmm. to create an investment plan to catch up with their savings. And then that means, though, They need those profits. So they are more and more baby boomers are actually saying we're going to rent in retirement. So what do they want to rent? They want to rent a nice, great apartment building or they want to rent a more affordable, smaller, what would be a starter home to millennials or to the past boomers. They're going to down the millennials are moving up into starter homes. The retiring baby boomers are not going to go from a McMansion to another McMansion. They're going to go to a smaller home or a nice apartment building. So that makes the rental market which actually would be peaking now, except for a downturn, will always boost rental markets. This market, the last, I just did a presentation in Dallas for a a rental real estate conference. And I was basically saying, no, baby boomers are going to cause this sector, rental real estate, to continue to grow for the next couple of decades. This has never happened before. And it's a good trend for everybody. Yeah, that's so interesting how that's changed. You know, I think there's another interesting element, two kind of related things. Number one, not many people have, you know, they talk about how millennials are under so much pressure. They've got student loan debt. They basically have a mortgage. They just didn't get a house included with it. It's a crummy right. deal. Uh, yeah. You know, they've, they originally moved into kind of a very anemic job market that, improve significantly. So they're doing a little better there. But I don't know, it's a really different kind of a generation. And the thing that I haven't heard anyone talk much about, Harry, is that those millennials are going to be inheriting money from their aging parents. Now, granted, people could if they take care of themselves, live a lot longer. But how do you analyze the transfer of wealth through inheritance? And okay. um, yeah. are, are the millennials overall in good shape or bad shape, just in a, like a sound bite? What are your thoughts about that? Well, first of all, this inheritance is not going to happen anytime soon. That ha- People 
tend to inherit money in their late 50s, early 60s from their parents who are dying in their late 70s and 80s. Mm-hmm. So, so that's that. Millennials are not even the peak, not even entered the workforce yet. Uh, it's the early millennials that are starting to buy houses and spend money, and they haven't even reached the peak in spending at 47. They're at about 42 to 43 today. I can already tell they're doing everything a year later. That's why I can say they're going to peak at 47. They're not even – the early millennials aren't even at 47 to confirm that yet. So they're nowhere near inheriting money. They have less financial assets and wealth at their age than baby boomers did because they've seen – because they've seen a major downturn turn in stocks and a major downturn. I mean, you got to realize baby boomers never saw a major downturn when they were their age and never thought real estate would always go up and never correct. Well, millennials don't think that way after seeing real estate go down 30 percent on average and in the bubbly markets like Las Vegas, Phoenix and and Miami and California, 60 percent or more. So millennials do think differently, more like the Bob Hope generation that started entering the workforce in the 30s. And then on top of that, oh, if, you, if that wasn't enough to, to slap your ass, oh, how about World War II? So millennials are going to be different than baby boomers. They're not as advantageous now. But what I tell millennials What I'm talking about, this reset in home prices, cost of living, and financial assets is going to allow millennials, when they need to most in the future, invest in stocks again, invest in real estate again, and make money. If you buy real estate now, especially in these bubbles, you buy these bubble stocks, you're not going to make any money for decades, and you're going to lose money in a downturn. So this downturn We talked about taking money from the top 20 percent and shifting it more to the everyday household. We're also who's going to lose the most money. These baby boomers own these financial assets from housing to stocks. Younger people don't have as much of that. It's going to shift money from the aging generation to the younger generation and going after this crash. Real estate is going to be cheaper. Borrowing is going to be cheaper. And then you're going to be able to buy stocks and say, oh, I could actually make 10 percent a year on these stocks again. You have no chance of that buying stocks at these levels. And, and there's very clear models that show that actually the best model shows that if you buy stocks, and this does not take into account my demographics and downturn or anything. If you just buy stocks at these valuations today on large on stocks, you're going to lose 2 percent a year for the next 20 uh 12 years compounded. Oh, that's painful. And that's without a downturn. Yeah, that is bad. And there's going to be downturns, obviously. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. Wow. Okay, so just to get clear, what does Harry Dent like? You like cheap rental real estate, thankfully. I like that, too. I know you like that. You don't like real estate in high-flying bubble markets, uh, cyclical markets. I don't like that either. So we agree there. Is there any other asset class? I mean, you're not a gold bug. You've predicted gold, you know, really going right. down quite a bit to yeah. 750 and maybe to 250 it hasn't happened but it, no, you know, it, it did have be, it did yeah, have my, a decline I raised that from yeah. 700 to 1000 but it's still yes it's going to go it's it's in a bear market rally now I think it'll settle somewhere between 700 and 1000 it will not fall as much as other commodities will not fall as much as stocks but it is not your safe haven in a deflationary economy a deleveraging economy it was the safe haven in the 1970s inflationary bust okay so what do you like is there anything okay. else what yes I like high quality bond. I like the 10 and 30 year U.S. Treasury bonds. They're, even though they're at low rates, they're going to go lower. The money, when everything else falls, real high end real estate, junk bonds, stocks and commodities, people are going to shift money in the safest stuff, even though they get low yield and those yields will go lower. In the Great Depression, the AAA corporates and the treasury bonds long term did the best they actually doubled in value over that decade they don't only not only held their value like cash they increased in value 10 15 20% during the downturn so that i like that i like apartment real estate investment trusts around residential not commercial rentals residential apartments and medical facilities and and you can find those those hold up the medical facilities have the best demographics and they're recession proof because people don't say, oh, just because the economy's down, I'm not going to, you know, 
go to the hospital when I break my leg so, sort of thing. Um, so I like those. And basically, there are no stock sectors. Yes, utilities and consumer staples will do better than consumer cyclicals or growth stocks. But still, and, and, you know, but, but still, still, still it's everything goes down. Right? Yeah. I, yeah, Jason, I did this decade ago. I looked at every stock sector in the 1930s and there was nothing that, that held its value and went up in that crash and, and would have been a good thing. Now, when they crash, oh, then then stocks, particularly emerging countries. I, I tell people in this crash, you want to buy the, the, again, the same type of stuff, the starter homes and ultimately the trade-up homes. And, and they're going to be the biggest uh, bargains, the McMansions by then, that the millennial is going to want. And you want to buy. Hang, hang on on that south. one. Let's talk about the McMansions again. I just feel, and this is just kind of a, you know, anecdotal, okay? I just don't see a market for those McMansions after the the baby boomers let go of them because the millennials they just don't strike me as the type that would even want a house like that even if it were given to them like if they inherited yeah. that house they would just sell it they they would sell it yeah, yeah I, I don't think they'd <laughs> like it yeah. so so i think those kinds of properties are really they're they're a conspicuous consumption they yeah. they're a, they're not environmentally friendly <laughs> you know there, there's just nothing about them that I think millennials would be attracted to am I right about that just kind okay. of I'm talking psychographics here right you know? but there's another side to it mm -hmm. so yes you're right I millennials are buying later because of caution and and student loans and and tighter lending since the and, great and delayed recession. family formation and, and some and, of yeah, them when right. they finally do buy in their mid 30s just go ahead and buy the larger home, but you're right. They're not as likely to buy that six bedroom, five, 6,000 square foot on a golf course somewhere mm -hmm. sort of thing. Okay. And that's going to come a little later anyway in their cycle. But what happens is the, it's going to be the McMansions, they, the smaller homes that they're buying and that the, 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 we just talked about the baby boomers in retirement are trading down to when they sell their McMansions. Those are going to hold up much better in the downturn. They're going to come out much better. The McMansions are going to be a bargain. So, so when it comes down to, yeah, I'm not that conspicuous stuff, but I could buy a 4,000 square foot house for only 10% more right. than a 2,500 that, square foot. That's going to be sort and, of an and, I, could rent, I right. could rent yeah. out part yeah. of it on Airbnb. Right, because I'm, I'm into the sharing economy oh, and I'm modern and I like having yeah. meeting new people. It's better than couch surfing. Yeah, I get now, it. Now, let me give you one better than this. And I just spoke for this guy mm -hmm. um, in the last year. There's a guy teaching people how to take large suburban McMansions and turn them into a not nursing homes, assisted living right. facilities yeah. with limited, you know, medical stuff and all this sort of right. stuff and make two to three times on those. Which okay. You Let's, rent I'm, I'm, Harry, Harry wow. I'm, I'm so glad you brought that up. I think that assisted living thing is totally overbuilt. I think it's oversupplied. Oh, um, no, no, no. They, it is today. Let me tell you why. Yeah. This is why you look at demographics. Right. People think, oh, the baby boomers are already nursing no, they're not. They're they're, a, they're aging are, in place. Are, 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 are fading because the Bob Hope generation is dying off. Baby boomers. If I do my normal lag for eighty four peak spending on nursing homes and assisted living for the baby boom, it's just bottoming in two thousand eighteen nineteen and will turn straight up for twenty six years and I think two thousand forty two or forty five. If I remember correctly, and they will never have enough of these things. Harry, so, I, so I, that's the I gotta last tell you, thing the boomers. Will do. I disagree for a couple of reasons. Number one, we've been talking about the graying of America since the 80s. That has been built in. There is so no, much no, no, of no, that no, no. Jason, Wait, you, wait, I'm wait. Telling you, hang you're on. Missing it. Okay, hang on. Let me just finish. Let the me graying just, in the 60s. I'm talking nursing homes or late 70s to I, mid 80s. I get it. I get it. But, are not even there but Harry, Harry, sure. okay. So, so, so yes, that's, <laughs> that's built in. I understand the 84 year lag. I totally get it. But here's the thing. Technology is the wild card in there. It's allowed people to age in place and people want to age in place. They don't want to go to an institution. And, you know, the idea that you can just 
have your aging parent wear an Apple Watch, and it will notify you if they fall, if their heart rate is too low, if their blood, not the blood pressure yet, it'll do their EKG. That old commercial, I've fallen and I can't get up, is way high tech now. There are all sorts of sensors that can be placed around Jason, houses Jason, you now. just talk yourself it's, out. What yeah. is less institutional than a six-bedroom home in a quiet neighborhood, maybe a half a mile oh, from your kids and their and your grandkids? I, I agree that they're going to sell the McMahon. Because the technology makes that make no, no, not sell it. You can take these McMansions, which are closer to oh, the kids. Oh, and buy them cheap and turn and, them and into just what you said, yeah, well, yeah. And, and use this. You're right. The technology allows you to put sensors in and things that make something like that more sophisticated right. without having to be a big bureaucratic institution. Fair enough, but they don't so have to. They don't have to have any. An they don't have to have any roommates at all. They can just be in their own place. That's what I'm getting. They don't need an assistant there. They okay. can just be in their own apartment or okay. whatever. First I don't of all, know. We'll see how it works. It's a pain in the ass to keep granny in your home, and and some people do it, some people don't. But even if my mother oh, not had in their home, father, I'm saying granny in her own home. She had That's to give it saying. up at a point. Yeah. It was unmanageable. Yeah, yeah. And if I'm an older person, and we we are, we have a really good friend that's 91 years old, just down the street from us, mm-hmm. the mother of some crypto friends we have here in Puerto Rico. She likes being in the nursing home. She's she's a block from her daughter, and she's uh, a half a mile from us, who are our best, her some of her best friends. She's hits with other people. She can play bridge and stuff. Other people like her and do stuff. Right? Why would you want to be one older person? With a bunch of younger people who live in with it don't have a lifestyle, anything like you. Yeah. So, yeah, so well, I'm just saying it doesn't take everybody. You're right. More people will age in home, and that's a good thing. But if you can age in a smaller, more technologically sophisticated home, not far from your relatives, but still have your own thing, be taken care of and not be a burden. I tell you, I, I know older people that don't specifically don't want to be a burden on their kids and grandkids yeah. by living in the house oh, when they get l- more and listen, more. Listen, 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 I agree. I'm not saying they're going to live with their parents. That's more of an Asian thing that there's intergenerational housing. You have a little bit of that in the U.S., but not that much. Um, I'm just saying they can age in place. They can still have their own home for much longer than right, before. But, but it's going to end up with one technology. lady, no man. That, see, by the time right. we get to all nursing the, home all base, the men it's, have it's 10 to 1 yeah. women to men. <laughs> I know. And you want to live as a lady by yourself in an apartment where you feel vulnerable with nobody and no very little technological sophistication that you can afford in a one-bedroom apartment rather than being in something that's a little more. I, I'm just saying. I don't know. It, it no. won't be for everybody, but I do see things changing in, in what you said about technological sophistication is important. We had, my wife had her mother and her aunt, which was like her second mother, both be in nursing homes and the service was not good. Yeah, right. Yeah, and there's all kinds of abuses that go on in those nursing like homes. Said, and you didn't and, want to be there. Yeah, right. And it was ten, it was ten thousand dollars a month. Oh, yeah. So this yeah. guy's showing people you get a few clients like that, and maybe you charge them five thousand a month, right. and you're making twenty, thirty thousand yeah. a month off a of McMansion that if you rent it out might be five thousand a rent. Right. Whoa. Yeah, well, just remember, it's got all you got all sorts of insurance issues and care issues and liability and, issues. And it's grumpy not as simple old as and grumpy looks. old people. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And and intrusive young people, children telling you what to do and, you know, filing complaints against you. And it's nothing is simple. OK, that's the point of life. OK, nothing is as simple as it looks. OK, Harry, let's just wrap up this whole macro discussion we've had with anything you want. Let's wrap it up. OK, we've talked about a lot of stuff today. Well, again, I mean, again, I, I get nothing but hated and scorned because <laughs> and, and I tell people, OK, wait a minute. I'm, I've called a perma bear now. This is ridiculous. I and you know, this was the most. Bu- I was the only guy that saw the great boom ahead. You were you were totally days. bullish like, through 2010. Well, me and much. Templeton. Uh, yeah. Templeton saw it, too, but okay. he saw it because of globalization and, and emerging market urbanization. I saw it in the developed countries. Greatest boom in history when people thought the U.S. and Europe was dead. And now I'm saying, look, we've had that great boom, and now we've had this unbelievable money-printing scheme. Oh, we're not going to deleverage debt. We're just going to cover it over with free money. Oh, does that sound like that would work? Something for nothing? Wave a magic wand, print $16 trillion, and all your problems go away. 
We, the reason we're going to have another big downturn, we have more debt than we had before the great financial recession. We didn't deleverage debt, some consumer debt, some financial debt. We have way more corporate debt now, and a lot of it buying their own stupid stocks. And we have massively more government debt. So, so we still have to get the debt down to reality, financial assets down to reality, cost of living back down to reality, or these young people, the millennials and millennials, they're sentenced to a poor Poor standard of living like the Japanese younger people have today. That's what I was alluding to earlier about Japanese young people don't want to have sex, date, and don't, don't even think about getting married unless you're you know, marrying somebody financially independent because you can't afford to have a kid. They don't have the benefits their parents had. The parents kept that in Japan. The young people have this zero coma economy, even with Three times the stimulus we've been put out comparably, and they're going nowhere. If we don't rebalance this debt, Jason, and go through what you always do after a debt bubble and financialize and have these financial assets come down, people lose money, but it may it clears the way for the next young generation. We are going to be like Japan in an endless coma economy, even when demographics are good and the countries are. So we need to go through this. I'm telling people – all you got, you can't control all of this. All you do is get out of the way. That, like we were saying today, both of us, you're going to own real estate, own a more affordable, less bubbly real estate that you can rent, and there'll be even bigger demand for rent in these kind of aging baby boomers, smaller houses, millennials buying smaller houses, the medical sectors in apartment buildings. That's what's going to hold up. Everything else, get out of the way. Hey, you may want to keep your primary home and live it until you die, but certainly do you use your vacation home that much. I'm living in a condo in Puerto Rico that is a vacation home. It's expensive on the beach, vacation home for wealthy Puerto Ricans and, and some gringos, and they're using it four to six weeks a year. Sell that. If you lived in your vacation home half, you may thought maybe you keep it, but but do you really want to keep the vacation homes and the McMansions will fall the most? All stocks will fall. The most bubbly, the tech stocks will fall the most. China, you know, and emerging countries always get hit the hardest. So just get out of the way. At these levels, the models say you're not going to make much money long term. And we get out of the way. And then if I'm right, even half right, and these things crash down, then you can rebuy financial assets and, and sectors of real estate and feel confident about it. But people think, oh, you know, you know, you just sit through downturns. Yes, you sit through normal downturns. You don't sit through that 90. I mean, go back and look at that 90 year chart. Every 90 years, we see these super bubbles crash, and we don't have recessions. We have depressions. Mm -hmm. You don't sit through financial assets and depressions except the safest ones. High-quality bonds, affordable rental real estate, that's pretty much it. Yeah. Harry, the one thing I would definitely take away from our discussion today is that financial assets, in other words, the Wall Street economy versus yes. real assets, the Main Street economy, the real economy, financial assets are, are just far more risky. I would, yes. I would, I would venture to say that all the time. Yeah. Good stuff. Harry, give out your website. Okay. HarryDent.com. That's, that's where we can learn more about us and get on our free newsletter. Good stuff. Harry Dent, thank you so much for joining us again. Thank you, Jason. Thank you so much for listening. Please be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss any episodes. Be sure to check out the show's specific website and our general website, HartmanMedia.com, for appropriate disclaimers and terms of service. Remember that guest opinions are their own. And if you require specific legal or tax advice or advice in any other specialized area, please consult an appropriate professional. And we also very much appreciate you reviewing the show. Please go Go to iTunes or Stitcher Radio or whatever platform you're using and write a review for the show. We would very much appreciate that. And be sure to make it official and subscribe so you do not miss any episodes. We look forward to seeing you on the next episode. Music.